I'm Tamara, and this is TELUS Talks with Tamara Taggart. We're bringing together experts, thinkers, and leaders, busting myths, sharing stories, and staying connected when Canadians need it the most. We're having unexpected conversations for unprecedented times. Hi, everyone. Today, we are talking with best-selling author and award-winning health reporter and columnist for the Globe and Mail, Andre Picard. Hi, Andre. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good. It's really good to see you and hear from you. I'm so used to just following you on Twitter and reading everything you write. I'm a big fan. So um, I really appreciate your voice when it comes to healthcare in this country. Um, I guess we, you know, it'd probably be best to start with COVID and because uh, you have been uh, following this very closely right across the country. Um, it's an interesting time to be a health reporter, isn't it? Yes, we, uh, you know, what's that, um, that curse? May you live in interesting times, very interesting time for me. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of something I've been preparing for unofficially for probably four decades now. So it's kind of the culmination of what stuff I've been doing for a long, long time. Mm. Would you say this is the, you know, I, I guess you've been writing, you've been writing on health for how long now? You've been with the Globe and Mail since 87, yeah, almost 40 years. So I started writing about AIDS in 1981, right around the time uh, AIDS uh, rose to prominence. And uh, so going on 40 years. Wow. So what are some of the biggest stories in your career uh, that 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 stick out for you? What sticks out for you? Well, I think AIDS has kind of been the arc of my career. I started writing uh, at the time I was in university at a university paper when AIDS came along. It was very much a political issue rather than a health issue. So I think that's always shaped the way I approach healthcare. I see it as a, a political, social, as much as medical. So I think AIDS, and I wrote a lot for many years about tainted blood. I wrote a book about tainted blood, followed the inquiry around the country for almost two years. So there's some stories like that that I've, have just been with me forever. And uh, infectious disease, uh, AIDS is one, but I've covered many, many over the years, SARS, Zika, Ebola, COVID, you name it. Uh, you know, that's one of the most interesting things to cover is infectious diseases. Mm. Do you, I mean, do you learn something new all the time or like, do you feel like you're always learning or because you've been doing this for so long, you, you've kind of seen it all? No, I think the beauty of this job is you learn stuff every single day, right? So it's, it's fascinating. It never gets boring and that's, we're lucky. And now do you get, did you, in the time when you were writing, obviously about AIDS, there was no social media, there was no, you couldn't, you couldn't, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you couldn't reach out to a reporter uh, like we can now with social media. How, how was the public uh, or your readership when you were writing about AIDS? Well, I think we had less of a sense of what our readership was, but, you know, papers were all important, right? If people waited till the paper arrived on their doorstep in the morning, and that was very impactful. Now we don't have that. It's very diffuse, right? It's just sort of constant. And I kind of, I miss that in a way. I miss having, especially when I read about COVID, I'm like, where's the big story of the day? I want something that really gives me a summary. And I think, uh, I think we don't have that anymore. And I think we're worse off for it. We just have all these, you know, tidbits, time after time, every minute, there's something going on. And we don't have a sense of what's going on on any given day or week. I was saying to someone the other day, I, I pity the historians in the future, because it's easy to go back, you know, I can go back to stories I wrote in the early 80s, and they're much longer than they are today, and they're more comprehensive. And a historian could look at that and get a sense of what was going on. If you look today, how, how do you figure out what was important on any given day every, when it changes every hour? So it's a very different right. different world for journalists. Yeah, it, really, it truly is. And uh, I mean, everybody talks about clickbait so much, right? We live in this world now where it's, you know, we're scrolling so fast and just looking for that. Like, am I going to read Andre today? What does it say? You know what I mean? As I'm scrolling by. Um, is that frustrating as as a journalist for you? I don't know. I, you know, they've had that same accusation forever. Before we had yeah. the social media, it was like, oh, you just have inflammatory headlines, right? It was the same thing. We didn't use the term clickbait, but it was the same complaint. But the reality is you have to boil things down. You have to get people's attention. I think what's changed is people have a 
a shorter attention span because we live in a different world. It's more mm. you know, busier. We don't have that one moment in the day when you pick up the paper, right? So I, I think some of those rituals have changed, but I, I don't think people, I think people have, are spoiled today. They have m- so much more selection. Uh, you know, I read uh, in the morning, I, I get on the computer early and I read papers from all over the world. I, I used to have a stack of papers, uh, you know, paper papers, and now I have the world's at my fingertips. So it's there's a lot of good in it and there's some bad. So how do you decide uh, what it is that your focus will be for the day when you're writing? Well, I'm just a big reader, so I read a lot. I Whatever catches my attention. I don't want to, I try to not do everything that everyone else is doing. So if everyone's doing just a big story, I try and do a little something different. I focus more on policy and very few people do that. So I have, in many ways, I have the field to myself because not a lot of people write about policy. So I, I'm spoiled in that way. I have a lot of choice about what I can write about. So you're basically on a, you know, an all day news cycle. You are probably being inundated all day with information. Um, where do you, you know, how do we simplify it for the average reader when like it's your job to be you know always looking at news i was in television for decades and it was just 24 hour news i'd get home and watch more news cuz i i lived it and i loved it how do we how do we answer the simple questions for people as journalists how do you you know like can i go to the park can i you know all these simple questions that are really affecting us day to day uh, how do we how do we boil it down for people so that we keep them safe well, I think we do, and we do a lot of this now, is we call it service journalism, right? So I spent a lot of time, I just wrote uh, 3,000 words worth of answering questions from readers. And I think that stuff is really important. And it was a lot of basic questions about uh, what does a mask do? Where do I buy a mask? How do I put it on? And it's stuff you think, well, it's simple, but it reminds you that people more than anything want really basic information. And we don't always do a good job of that. So I think the papers, even TV has done a good job of that, of doing a lot of this service journalism for people saying like, here's what COVID is and here's how to put on a mask and here's what a second wave means. Uh, you know, it's amazing to me as someone who reads a lot of science that suddenly everyone can talk about an epidemic curve, right? It's just part mm-hmm. of our kitchen conversation, something that five months ago was the lot of scientists, only scientists and epidemiologists talked about this. Now we all talk about it. Oh, I was watching the Ontario epidemic curve and it's uh, flattening mm-hmm. a bit. And that that's good. That's, uh, you know, we're becoming, becoming more science literate. Right. And I mean, you are, you're writing for a national paper. Uh, we are, um, you know, we're a country where, uh, each province kind of does their own thing when it comes to healthcare. Um, we all, uh, there's so many different rules and regulations and policies like right across. So how do you, how do you um, make it clear for people? Like you might be writing about something that's happening in Ontario. I'm over here in British Columbia and I'm like, that, that none of this affects me. There's nobody has been sick or, you know what I mean? Like how do we understand the urgency of something like COVID-19 in this country, I'm living in a province where we're, we're doing pretty good. So why should I care about the rest of the country? Yeah, I think I think the way you do it is it's a big country. I write for a national paper for a long time. You look for th- you look for trends, you look for commonalities, and then you look for unusual things. So in this case, we're focusing a lot on Quebec and Ontario because that's mm. where the the bulk of the pandemic is happening. And these days, it's actually it's Toronto and Montreal. That's what our whole epidemic is now in Canada. So that's where the focus is. But if you know if there is a thousand cases tomorrow in Nova Scotia, we'd focus intensely on Nova Scotia. So mm-hmm. you, you find ways of doing about writing the big picture by focusing on on smaller things. And that's journalism is a lot about that, choosing an anecdote or an example, and then using it to, to illustrate a bigger point. How do you think we're doing in Canada compared to uh, the rest of the world when it comes to, you know, communication as a country and, uh, you know, response to this pandemic? Well, that's an example of where you have to break it down by region, right? So it's mm-hmm. really different. Uh, uh, BC has distinguished itself as being the, the communications leader. You know, we have you have Dr. Bonnie Henry. She's become sort of this public idol almost. 
And uh, she's really shown how you communicate properly. And you have at the other end of the spectrum, Ontario, eh, not so great on the communication, really struggling. The messages are muddled and mixed and it's not clear who's in charge. So you have to make those distinctions. And and so how are we doing overall? Not bad, but not doing great in the two, the two big provinces, unfortunately. Uh, if you look at us globally, and you know we're a global, we can get on the computer and read anything in the world. Globally, unfortunately, we're kind of batting above our weight. Canada is always in the top 15 countries most affected. And if you look at population, we're about the 40th most populous country in the world. So we have way more uh, COVID proportionally than we should have. And that, that's unfortunate. And it's really unfortunate because we, we started fairly late, right? So that we had the advantage of knowing what was going on elsewhere in Asia, in parts of Europe, and we were still pretty slow to react. And I think a lot of that is the Canadian, you know, there's a lot of good things about the Canadian uh, approach to life. We're pretty mellow, we're pretty cautious, but in this case, it didn't serve us well. We've acted very incrementally, very slowly, very cautiously. And we know in retrospect, the countries that are doing best in the world are the ones that did stuff. They didn't necessarily do the right stuff, but they acted really quickly and, and they took action. And that's, I think there's a big lesson there for future pandemics. Uh, I wrote the other day, uh, uh, it's better to be uh, fast and half wrong than slow and half wrong. And Canada, mm. unfortunately, is in the slow and half wrong category. Nobody got this right overall, and we're never going to, but it's better to act quickly. Right. And so when you say act quickly, um, you mean we could have like closed our bo- our borders earlier. We could have, you know, uh, stopped flights from coming in or whatever it might be. That's what you're talking about, those reactions. Yeah. And I think, you know, in particular, closing the border to the U.S., I think was much more important than closing the international border in retrospect again. But we could have done that quickly. I think our, our shutdowns, our lockdowns were very, very timid. You know, when European countries shut down, they shut down. Like I saw pictures of Italy. And if you went on the street, bang, you had a fine. And Canada was like, well, don't go out unless you want to go out. And, you know, we kind of a little too Mm. mellow for our own good at the beginning of this, I think. Yeah. And it's interesting. I find it interesting that you say that because a, a lot of people feel the same way as you. But then you see these reactions of some who, you know, are saying that, you know, we're losing our freedoms because we're in lockdown. I'm like, here in BC, we are not locked down. <laughs> like, there's no lockdown. Like, we have not lost any freedoms. Like, we're, if wearing a mask is okay. Um, it's it's interesting how even the tiniest hint at that really makes some people uncomfortable that, you know, we should we should close this and we should do that. It's, it's, it's fascinating to watch how this pandemic uh, is shown a lot of cracks, don't you think, in who some of us are? It showed some cracks, but I think it showed the difficulty of being in public health because everybody has a different risk tolerance. So you're speaking to the broad public and you say one thing, you say a simple phrase, you know, the epidemic curve is rising and half the population is going to freak out and the other half is going to go, oh, so that means nothing, right? So it's really, really difficult to communicate these broad public health issues to a a very diverse population. So Mm -hmm. it's always going to be a challenge. Now, let's talk about the mask for a second, because, you know, um, there's a lot of people that don't have a problem wearing a mask and and it's not a big deal. And, and there's a lot of people who apparently have a big problem wearing a mask. Um, uh, Dr. Tam uh, has, you know, uh, again, a scientist going on scientific information, uh, communicating it uh, to the country. Each province is different. Do we, is that where we kind of lose some people is in our, you know, our, our, our national message and then our provincial message is kind of different sometimes and just about masks in particular. Yeah, masks is a real sore point for people. I get a lot of blowback on that, uh, and it's it's a hard one. But, you know, if you take the example of Dr. Tam, so she's criticized a lot because she changed her position. And I find that an odd, a very odd response. I think a scientist who adapts to th- changing uh, social norms, to changing science, that's exactly what we want, right? So to criticize someone for not being rigid strikes me as very rigid. So I, I, I found that strange. Uh, masks are also one of those things that it's 
very simple on the surface, but actually quite complicated. Like many simplistic solutions, it's not that simple. So I, my big worry about masks is not, you know, I've, I've said all along, if you want to wear a mask, wear one, all the power to you. There's not really a downside to it, except the da- there is a downside. And the downside is people take it as a silver bullet. So people wear a mask and then, well, I don't have to social distance, or I'm going to go to three stores instead of one because I feel safer. So there's all these social consequences. Uh, you know, oh, any idiot can wear a mask, right? I get emails saying that all the time, but it's not true. It's actually fairly complicated. Uh, they teach courses in medical school on how to don and doff a mask because the little details matter. You can infect yourself more than you otherwise would. So the, all these seemingly simple things are, are actually complex. And that's, again, hard to communicate. And when you talk about that, people feel insulted. Oh, you're saying I'm stupid. No. I'm saying that this is not as simple as it, it looks on the surface. Mm. You know, when when we look at um, racism around COVID-19 and, um, you know, messages that are um, or, or, or just names and, you know, even even the name of the virus. Right. And uh, and, and and watching uh, that. Uh, be directed at Dr. Tam, a scientist, uh, and and other other people in this country. It's been it's been. Have you been surprised? I mean, you 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 wrote about AIDS, and so you know there was a lot of discrimination. I mean, an enormous amount is uh, and still is um, around that virus. So with this one, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I wish I was surprised, but I wasn't surprised in the least. Uh, it's something it's existed during the pandemic, uh, you know, during the Black Plague. People were discriminated against in the Middle Ages. It's something in human nature. We look for people to blame. So you have to understand the psychology of it. So you always want to blame someone. Uh, that's why we have anti-Semitism. That's why we have racism. People always want to blame someone for their misfortune or their fear. So natural response. So I think, again, it's a challenge of communicating to people, listen, that, you know, yes, uh, the epi- the first epicenter was Wuhan, but that doesn't mean people who look Chinese are going to be more, you know, there's all these prejudices that uh, maybe the media fuels them a little bit, but I think just people cling on to them as some kind of life raft. I, I want a- an explanation for this. And that's true of, you know, we have lots of quackery and stuff these days on the internet, all these magical cures. And that's all it is. It's all people longing for something. You know, I want this to be over. And it's understandable, but you have to you have to work against that and try and counter it as much as you mm-hmm. can. I mean, I guess we see it with every with most medical conditions, you know, like uh, with cancer. Right. If you if you say you have cancer. Uh, you will get, and I know this from experience, inundated with, uh, you know, you should be drinking carrot juice, only carrot juice because it does this, or you should be eating apricot kernels or something, or this horse oil or whatever it might be. And I, it's right. We want to, I, I want it to be over. And it's, it's, I just think it's fascinating. And social media has really, um, I mean, it's, it's just such a bizarre experience to be experiencing a pandemic, first of all, uh, and then to be experiencing it uh, through the eyes of social media that so many people are, right? There are you know, millions of people around the world that are, are watching this unfold on social media, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite the thing to watch. <laughs> so yeah. I can't imagine from, I mean, you are um, uh, a seasoned journalist who, this is your beat. You write about help. Um, and, and you are the facts, you know, you are, you are the facts. And so you write facts. My point is, do you ever get attacked on social media for being biased, for being, uh, not telling the truth or anything like that? Or? Oh, absolutely. Nonstop, nonstop. You know, the fake news business, the, uh, mm. you know, I think that hydri- hydroxychloroquine is the, the cure and you say it's not, uh, how dare you? Uh, it's it's relentless. So I think the social media, you have to learn to not only have a thick skin, but to sort of take it with a, a grain of salt to understand. Again, I, I'm a big fan of history, of medical history. So you understand that these movements, this minority of loud people has always existed, right? It existed uh, when the first vaccination came along with Jenner. 
there were huge protests about against vaccination, even though it's one of the greatest advances in scientific history. And they they're exactly the same arguments 300 years later. And you kind of go, ah, well, they're going to be with us forever. So I, I, I don't worry about people on, on the margins who are sort of out there too, 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 too much. I guess you're right. It's, it's been happening for hundreds of years, except now those people have a phone. <laughs> yeah, they have a much bigger <laughs> megaphone. And yes. I think the other thing is, unfortunately, I think in the general public, there's a lot of doubt. We live in skeptical times. We live in tense times. So people are, I worry more about the skeptics than the anti anything. So especially, you know, I read a lot about vaccination. And I think the most important group is the the parents who are well-meaning and skeptical, and they kind of say, oh, I've never seen measles. Why would I give my kid this poison, right? I'm old enough that I've had all these diseases. I, you don't have to convince me about vaccination. I had all these horrible things as a child. But a lot of us are spoiled. A lot of people are spoiled. They've never seen this, and they want the best for their children. It's all understandable, but we have to communicate better that this this is a reality of whether it's showing them pictures of smallpox or or whatever uh, unfortunately lots of people are getting education because measles is coming back and mumps is coming back but that that's a, a pretty harsh way to teach people this lesson yeah it comes down to privilege right it always gets privilege we are very yeah. privileged that we yeah you know as someone who's traveled written in africa when you see a mother who's walked three days to get her kids immunized because she understands you know, that one, she's already had a baby who's died of measles. She'll go do anything in the world to, to save her other children. You see that and it's really moving. And then you come home and you see somebody at Whole Foods saying, oh, I wouldn't, you know, put poison in my child's body. You think that that is about privilege. One hundred percent. What, uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to long term care facilities, I mean, we have to talk about this and y- you write about it. I'm. Uh, I have a child with a disability, which is what always draws me to you because, um, you know, some of my friends I know are you know, like Isabel Jordan and Sue Robbins. And, um, you know, I know you know them too. And and you are, to somebody like me, a parent of a, a child with a disability, I look to you for that voice, right? That voice that is helping me learn as a parent, but also... Um, hopefully, hopefully engaging others to understand, right? Something that is really hard to understand uh, if you don't live it. Long-term care facilities, you know, we, we're talking all the time about these long-term care facilities, COVID outbreaks there. Um, seniors, we know that uh, most seniors have disabilities that are in these long-term care facilities. There are people with disabilities living in these uh, care facilities right across the country. And I mean, why are people so surprised that that some people are not receiving excellent care in these facilities now? <laughs> yeah, I think they're surprised because they, they just don't know, right? It's it's ignorance. And in the true sense of that term, it's not disparaging, but it's just lack of knowledge, I think, a lot of it. And I think also on that issue of, you know, frail seniors, people with dementia, kids with disabilities, it's all really the same issue. And I, I've been lucky over the years, uh, very early on in my career, to meet a lot of parents of children with severe disabilities and to learn a lot from them. And what they teach you is that uh, if you can't care for the most needy, uh, if you fail them, you fail everyone. That's the reality. So to me, that's what our social safety net, that's what our health system is about. It's making sure that nobody's left by the curb. And that's that's why I write about these populations often, because I think they're so important. They they inform all our care across the board. And I think that's that's the story with long term care to me is we've just decided that we have a group of citizens that don't matter anymore. They're disposable. Let's just stick them off somewhere. Uh, You know, I. I think, sadly, we've just put people somewhere to die rather than put them somewhere to be cared for. And that fundamental approach has to change. It's a, it's existed for 20 years or more, and we have to address it. And this pandemic, if any good is to come out of this, is that we're going to blow up that system and start from, from scratch. And everything that applies to these seniors applies to, to kids with disabilities. It's the same, same issues. It is. Um, I guess, I guess, you know, I don't know if I have a lot of faith that I guess what for me, it, it's upsetting because I think, well, this has been we have we have sent away 
people with disabilities for over a hundred years, like you know, institutions, right? And Ontario is uh, Ontario uh, has is a real leader in that. You know what I mean? And not in a good way. Um, and now we're seeing these long-term care facilities in Ontario and BC, and it, it's everywhere. Um, and I agree with everything you said, but I'm not sure that we, do we have the, do we have the, um, we might want to change it, but that's not going to come cheap. Yeah. I don't think money, I hope money is not an issue. Well, we a, it always is though. You yeah. Know? But we spend a lot of money delivering bad care. We can spend a lot of money delivering better care. I think that's the issue. I don't, I don't think money is a big, big factor in this. I think it's a, a philosophical issue. I, I think we have to, you know, what we have now is ministries of nursing homes and we should have ministries of care, of elder care. We have to think about, I often do speeches. I do lots of speeches. And one of the things I always do at my talks, and if I'm talking anything related to the elderly or people with disabilities, I always say, let's do a show of hands. Who would like to live in a long-term care home? Nobody ever raises their hand. I even spoke to a group of long-term care facility owners, and they didn't raise their hand, right? So why are people being sent there? No one wants to go there. Now, the reality is some people will need institutional care, but none of it should be delivered the way it is now. Uh, we can do it in smaller facilities. We can do it with better staffing ratios. We can make it a philosophical and political priority to say people are going to age in place. We're going to keep them at home as much as humanly possible. Countries do this. Countries like Denmark, the Netherlands, they don't have these big, awful institutions, and they didn't have thousands of deaths. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. direct result of our failed public policies that we are killing people. And we have to we have to talk about it in those terms. Mm -hmm. I, listen, I agree with you 100 percent. I, I just I guess I feel a lot of um, I just feel so much disappointment when I read and when I see and because I know this information. I, you know, I volunteered when I was a kid and extended long term facilities. And, uh, you know, I know what I saw then. Um, uh, how do we how do we make people care? Like well, I, think I think that that's such a huge part of it, right? How do you make someone? How do we make other people care enough? I think the way we make them, we try to make them care in journalism is we try to make things, we try to personalize them, right? That's why we use anecdote. That's why you use stories. The reality about long term care, about elder care, is we're all going there, right? We're not getting any younger. We're an old society, age wise. So I think we have to have, make a decision of how do we want to live. I think that's what the big societal question that emerges out of this is: how do we treat our elders? And the answer to that question is badly. We treat them abysmally, and this is the proof. And we can change it. Now you're quite right. It's easy to be skeptical and even cynical about this. Especially, I've written. I can't tell you how many reports I've written about about how, how we should improve uh, care for the elderly. Uh, when, you know, the last round was when a, uh, a nurse became a serial killer in Ontario. And I thought, well, after that, you know, if you can get away with murder, literally, and she would have never been caught had she not confessed, if you can get away with murder, there's some pretty fundamental problems, right? I, I wrote about fires where dozens and dozens of people burned to death because no one could get them out. And I thought, oh, mm. people are not going to tolerate this. So it's easy to be cynical, and it's also easy to be cynical when we look at what happened with mental health. So in mental health, we had this great awakening in the 1960s. We closed down all these horrific institutions, but we discharged people into nothing, right? We didn't replace them with other kinds of community care. And the result is today we see it on our streets every single day. You have thousands of people sleeping on the streets of Vancouver. Why? Because they don't have mental health care. You know, these things are all, we know what happens. That's not a surprise. So it easy, it's easy to be cynical and say it's not going to get fixed. But I, even though I'm a journalist, I try to be hopeful. <laughs> I try Sometimes. so hard. I try very hard to be hopeful also. Uh, with long-term care facilities, do you think there's a difference between private and, uh, you know, are, are private long-term care facilities a bad thing? Like we hear a lot that, oh, these are bad. Yeah, I think it's very dangerous to bring the debate down to something so simplistic. 
Uh, there's a lot of good private homes. There's some bad private homes. There's a lot of bad public homes. Uh, there's some bad, good public homes. So I, I, if you bring it down to that simplistic a notion, I, I think we're going to get ourselves, we're never going to solve this. I think the issue has to be, let's make sure there are standards. Uh, let's make sure that care is affordable. Uh, let's make sure that people who work there want to work there and they have good conditions. That can happen in any number of payment models. And that's if we get stuck on that in that dogmatic mm -hmm. private bad, public good, that's that's not true. And if you want to back it up with data, uh, in Quebec, actually, the vast majority of deaths in long-term care are in public homes uh, because there are very few private homes in the province. So it's not it's not a magical solution. So I, I, yeah. I always get caution about uh, that, that uh, black and white uh, solutions. Well and, and that's what we see sometimes when we are, you know, just reading headlines. It's like, oh, you know, the government sold all these all these public homes to private. And now look what's happened. It's like, well, not really. Let's, you know, dig in a bit more. But uh, yeah, it's very interesting how I could talk to you for hours just about um, long term care facilities. But I do want to and ask about. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say we have to you have to remember to uh, when you say, oh, private care is bad, you have to remember why we have it. And the reason we have it is because governments refuse to spend on infrastructure. Why do they refuse to spend on infrastructure? Because the public is not tolerant of governments having debt. So they flop off their mortgages to private providers, and then they pay them back and pay with interest. So that it's all it's ultimately our fault, right? If we want no private providers, we have to be willing to have debt just like we have mortgages in our home. So when, when we have these arguments, we have to have them fully, is what I mm -hmm. hope. Exactly. What about all these bailouts with COVID-19? How are you feeling about the... We're hearing a, a lot of bailouts. I'm still waiting for people with disabilities, but I'll just keep waiting. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, actually the single most important health measure that's come out of COVID-19 is the government pro providing income support. I think that's really, you know, it's reminded us that the, the single most important thing for our health is having an income, having a roof over our heads. That's what matters ultimately, more than medicine, more than all this other stuff, being able to shop, uh, you know, going a whole month without shopping. That's ter terrible, but it doesn't matter if you don't have an income, right? Mm -hmm, so I think mm -hmm. that those income support programs that governments have brought in federally, especially, but provincially as well, I think they're really, really important. Now, that's the positive. Now, the negative is I think there are far too many corporate bailouts and not enough uh, in bailouts of individuals. To me, support should go to people and the people should spend their money supporting whatever they want, corporations. So when to me, you shouldn't be giving billions of dollars to an Air Canada, which has assets which are worth money and they can rebuild their company. Yeah, they suffered, you know, shareholders suffered a little bit, too bad. That's the risk that goes along with being a shareholder and being in business. But individuals are the ones you really have to prop up. And you have to give not equal uh, support to people. You have to give equitable support. Some people need more support. People living in care, uh, people with disabilities, uh, people with mental health, uh, most mental illness. So you have to adapt these programs to individuals. So I'd like to see a lot more focus on that, on people and getting people back uh, up on their feet and working mm -hmm. rather than just bailing out corporations kind of willy-nilly. And, and to be fair, in Canada, we're a lot smarter about this than in the U.S. In the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, the bailouts for COVID-19 are a, a boondoggle for billionaires. We have to we have to be frank about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about, you know, we, we're seeing... Uh, for example, here in BC, people with disabilities getting an extra three hundred dollars uh, a month. When, which is, uh, anyways, we, again, we could talk for hours about that. But I'll just use this as an example. When COVID nineteen is over, or there's a vaccination, or it's, uh, you know, time has run out on this extra three hundred dollars a month. What we just take it away and we go back to the way it was. Well, I think that's going to be one of the big challenges, right? So uh, any number of examples, uh, uh, bolstering a bit for people with disabilities, the $4 an hour raise that we gave our uh, personal support workers, will that be permanent? Uh -huh. It better be. But I think a lot of this discussion is going to come when we stop talking a little less about the illness. I think those will be really interesting economic discussions. 
another positive coming out of this is I think we're really looking seriously at the issue of basic income, right? So the, the federal bailout, that's essentially what it is, $2,000 a month for most people. That's a basic income. So if we're doing it now, why not do it? If it works now, why wouldn't it work later? And you're seeing, we're seeing countries, I, I was reading about Spain is looking seriously at making this permanent, their basic income. So I think they're, they're, they're always good. There's always good that comes out of these crises. Uh, a lot of great things came out of the Great Depression as they created social programs for the first time and they became permanent. So what's going to, what permanent fixes, what benefits are going to come out of this? Hopefully that'll be one of them. Mm -hmm. But it's also a reminder of, you know, how little we give people, support people in the first place. And hopefully that's part of the discussion. I I really hope it is. Do you think that um, COVID is, is it, is it worthy of all this news hype that we have? It's like COVID-19 all the time. And, and I mean, is should we be talking about it this much in the media? Well, I think we always sort of go overboard. That's part of the nature of the beast in a way. Uh, but I think it, it really is a one once in a century event, right? I don't think you can underplay. A lot of people now are saying, oh, it wasn't that bad, but it's not over, right? We're just, we're in the, if you lose a baseball analogy, we're kind of in the first inning, maybe the mm. second if we're lucky, but there's a, there's a long way to go. Uh, again, I, I was rereading a, a book that I, I love called The Great Influenza, because I think we can learn a lot yes. from, from the, the pandemic. And, you know, in 1918, the first wave was bad, but it wasn't that bad. People went about out their lives again, and the second wave was really, really devastating. It was way worse. So I think we're not we're not out of the woods with this. It doesn't mean we're going to repeat 1918. The world's different. But yeah, maybe we're going overboard, but I'd rather we write too much about it than, than be complacent. And, and my biggest worry these days is I think people are like, yeah, yeah that's done. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah, it's well, okay. it's summer, it's summer, and it's all okay. And yeah, we, we talk so much about the second wave. And I, I think you're right that people just, uh, there's, there's um, a risk involved, right, with just o- overload of information. Uh, and it makes you just want to kind of turn it off and focus on something else. Do you, I, I really think that COVID-19 has shown how important our, our news media is. Well, I'd like to think so. I think, you know, we have unprecedented readership, but we have no income, right? So actually this pandemic is going to, it's going to be devastating for the media. I'm not, a lot of media properties are just simply not going to survive. We've already lost about a hundred community papers in in Canada in the last four months because of this. There is no advertising revenue. Uh, People demand that, you know, all our COVID coverage is still not behind a paywall. It's all free. And people think that's another problem with the internet. People think everything's magically free. Right. And it is, but only to a certain extent. Once there's no uh, media doing the digging uh, for other things, for other people to steal and put online for free, what's going to happen, right? So exactly. I, I'm, always, I'm always perplexed by the people who say, oh, the mainstream media sucks, it should die. <laughs> say, okay, maybe, maybe it sucks, but what's going to replace it? It's not going to be better, right? Exactly. So, yeah, so people, and I mean, we have to find a we have to find a way of of monetizing information. Uh, it has to be affordable, has to be accessible, but it also has to be able to to pay for itself so that we can be these watchdogs that we're supposed to be. Yeah, and I mean, in a lot of ways, the genie's out of the bottle, right? Because when we when we first, you know, when the internet was first giving allowing us to access this information, it was free. Uh, and now, like the Globe and Mail, for example, uh, my friend Gary Mason, every time somebody comments on one of his tweets and they say paywall, he always tweets back and says pay for journalism. And people are offended by that. But it's like, well, the, the reporter needs to be paid. It needs to like there's so much that needs to happen in order for this to um, uh, be accessible for people. And it's not it's not like it's outrageously expensive. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm very much like Gary. I don't have any tolerance for people complaining about paywalls. Uh, my my glib answer is always, do you complain about the coffee paywall at Starbucks? Because nothing nothing's free, right? Uh, people pay their Netflix, and they don't want to pay for the newspaper. I, I, I just don't get it. I 
And, but as you mentioned, the, the genie's out of the bottle. I think the media has to take some of the blame for giving away its product for a long time. Uh, they were very arrogant. We used to be hyper profitable when these young kids and their internet thing came along. And I remember that. I'm from the pre-internet era. The, the newspaper owners were very, oh, sure, sure, we'll give you our content. Here you go, kids. Have fun. And now they're running the show, right? Facebook, Twitter, to a lesser extent. But uh, mm. I think people, if we're in a world where there's only Facebook and there's no Globe and Mail, there's no CBC, I, I think people will very much regret that. As yeah. much as they may hate the mainstream media, I think they'll, I hope they only don't only appreciate it when it's not there anymore, but I think it's in big, big trouble. I think it's in trouble too, but I hope it never goes away because there is so much value in it. And I think that, you know, we're seeing that, we're seeing that now more than ever to be able to uh, go and read an article, a well-researched article, or watch a report that you know is fair. And, but yeah, I, I hope, I hope that this shines a light on how important it is, especially local media. I need to know what's happening in my city in my province, in my country. And yeah. local media was doing relatively well until this. And this has been a real death blow to, to much of the local media, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is your biggest worry right now? I think my biggest worry COVID related is uh, about complacency. That we just say, yeah, done, been there, done that, move on. You know, I don't think I think we have to I think we have to get on with life. I don't think the lockdown should be forever. Uh, but I, I think we really have to figure out how to live with the virus rather than just being fearful of it. And it's finding that balance about finding new ways of how do we shop? How do we work? How do we go to school? And I think we have to take these as an opportunity to do things better and not just take them as oh, this is going to be temporary. You know, we're going to send the kids in the class for of 15 for a few months, and then we'll get back to our cramming 40 into a class. I hope we don't do mm -hmm. that stuff. I hope we actually learn and benefit from some of the changes forced on us. I hope you're right. And uh, non-COVID-19, what in health is on your mind? Well, I'm watching, I, I'm actually very interested in, in the Black Lives Matter protests. I think they're a real reminder again of what I mentioned before, how you know, the social determinants are so important to our health. I, I think this discussion about the health impacts of racism is way overdue. Uh, I was just writing uh, before we were talking, I was filing my story for tomorrow talking about this, how I, I think, you know, people are saying, oh, we have to stop the protests because we're going to have more COVID. But I, I don't believe that. I think we have to say, listen, there's sometimes a price to pay for improving society. Uh, this has happened for really awful reasons, but it's happening now. Maybe the timing's bad, but too bad. We have to encourage uh, these protests. We have to answer the call of the protests to, to fix inequalities. And this is as good a time as any to do it. Uh, if we get a few hundred or a few thousand more infections as a result, well, too bad. To me, that's a, a price worth paying for a, a more just society. Hmm. Andre, you are... Um... You are a Canadian gem. You really are. Um, you can read Andre uh, in the Globe and Mail. You can follow him on uh, Twitter. You are, uh, what's your Twitter handle again, Andre? Uh, Picard, Picard on Health. On, Picard on Health. And um, you are, uh, I love I love how active you are on Twitter and the information that you put out. It is, uh, you are uh, a nice voice Uh for a lot of us. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to me today. And, um, and I look forward to reading your future columns. So thank you so much, Andre. I really appreciate it. Well, it's a pleasure. It was nice talking to you and uh, stay well. I will. You stay well too. And be sure to join us here on TELUS Talks with Tamara Taggart every week. <laughs>